this is going to be heading. Um, uh, so, to, to, to kind of begin with that, my background largely comes from the domain of music. Uh, I've been working in that area, music technology area for quite some time, uh, also in video and audio signal processing kind of areas uh, over the past about nearly 15 years. So, uh, and uh, I was super thrilled to find uh, the low latency audio support in browsers coming up around sometime 2011, if I recall. The, and uh, given that my first exposure to programming itself was through making noises on machines, uh, this was super thrilling that you could you could just launch a browser and uh, make noises with it. So uh, I'll see if I can relive some of that thrill uh, through this talk. So my uh, my agenda is going to be fairly simple. Uh, I'm going to run through a personal history of noise making on computers. So th why I say that this is originally I intended to uh, make this a kind of a whirlwind tour of computer music, but I cannot possibly do justice to that. So I decided to make it, make this a, a personal uh, um, version of it. So, how my engagement itself began with audio and computers. Uh, then uh, dive into the web audio APIs architecture and uh, uh, conventional architectures in uh, computer music systems. Then uh, uh, we look at some of the primary uh, gotchas that people run into when they when they are first faced with the web audio API, uh, and uh, how we can use a few techniques, simple techniques, to solve them. Uh, one of them being the dynamism of the signal flow graphs, and then uh, um, the intricacies of just-in-time scheduling of audio events. Uh, and this stuff is evolving. The spec is not finalized just yet, and uh, there are some nice goodies in the, uh, I mean, just waiting to spring on us. So uh, I'll talk a bit about them towards the end, and uh, all of this goes with demos. So no fun talking about audio without sound. So this, uh, um, uh, as I mentioned, I just want to uh, give a personalized uh, history of uh, uh, my engagement with uh, computer, computers and noise making. So in the beginning, my very first thing was the screen going blank. I think. So, so uh, when I first started, uh, uh, when I was first exposed to computers, uh, just about every machine was capable of making some interesting sound or the other, and that was fascinating to begin with. Uh, and uh, that played a large role in how I approached uh, and what got me into computing in the first place. So it's it's pretty important for me. Uh, uh, and just to keep a bit of context around that, um, the. Uh, Seymour Papert, this, uh, this the work done by Seymour Papert was even before I was born, so uh, that's where that begins. So he uh, formulated this uh, extension to this notion of constructivist learning, where uh, he believed that uh, the true process of learning involved making things, where the byproduct of something is making something, that's a, a byproduct of learning has to be making some tangible product. So uh, he made this total graphic system, which is a robot that kids control by writing, typing commands such as forward 50, left 30 degrees, kind of very simple commands. And then kids went on to master geometry through this without being taught about the rules of Euclidean geometry. That's a, a phenomenal uh, uh, work uh, at that time. And his key thing is that you need to have this kind of manipulative material. And the early machines that we had provided this kind of manipulative material. Anybody recognize this machine? Here, Sinclair ZX Spectrum. I think uh, it's probably older than most folks. <laughs> uh, so this, uh, even this, this is a home computer. So it looks like a keyboard, but it's an entire computer in there. Two megahertz processor, 128 KB memory, if you're lucky. Uh, and uh, you plug this into the TV, into your TV, turn it on, and you've got a prompt. You can type basic commands with the prompt. and uh, you could type this beep duration pitch and it would make a noise. Like today's computers fail by this benchmark, in my, uh, in my opinion. Uh, the, the extensive boot process that you have to go through without, before you can begin to make something interesting out of the machine is just so appalling. Uh, 
so it's this ZX Spectrum had this beep command that was like really cool. This is the BBC Micro. Uh, this had more extensive sound generating uh, routines. It had a better audio subsystem there, and you could you could uh, do a variety of noises with there. There were noise generators in there as well as pitch uh, uh, um, tone making uh, routines as well. So that was a sound command that you could give to these machines to make these sounds. Even DOS GW Basic had the play command where you can you could give it a string that's constructed out of like uh, letters of letters representing notes and durations of these notes, and it would play that in sequence, and it would wait till that playback finishes. So this this was even before GUIs came into the mix. What happened to all of that? Like after uh, for about almost uh, I don't know about eight years or something. The ability to make quick sounds with our machines just vanished. It just went into some kind of a black hole. Today, that stuff is turning around. So that's the uh, that's what I want to highlight now. So before the Web Audio API, tough luck. So if I were to give my uh, machine to my son and I, I expect him to some somehow produce some interesting sounds of his own construction, I'd be out of luck before this. But now, what's happened is that we have. Uh, um, uh, uh, if Chrome, if you're lucky enough to have Chrome installed on your machine uh, by default when you buy it, so you just launch Chrome, go into this uh, to, into the console, and just you can type commands that make noises, very interesting and high fidelity and low latency noises. That's fabulous. So let me look at what we, what it would take to do this beep in uh, in the Web Audio API, and we'll just use this as our central piece for today for this today's discussion. So I'm going to pull up. So this, I'll just walk you through this code a little bit. So yeah, it's not a one-liner by any means, right? But it's got things. At least you can write a function to do the beep that the Simple as ZX Spectrum was good at doing with just out of the box. Uh, this is a, uh, and it's pretty straightforward to achieve this because the uh, API is organized in a very uh, in a very familiar signal signal flow graph kind of uh, uh, structure. So uh, I'm going to just go ahead and make that beep now. And uh, uh, I'm always thrilled <laughs> when this happens. Every time I do this, I get goosebumps in some sense. So there you go. That's a beep function. And I hope some sound comes out of this. 330 hertz, and I want it for two seconds. OK. Uh, a tone comes up, and I can modify that. Six. six. Sorry? Fonts, okay. So, so there goes beep. Okay, so uh, at the heart of this beep is a very simple um, structure. Which is uh, a graph that goes like this. So you got a uh, sawtooth wave generator that's being plugged into some kind of a gain that controls this volume, and then you plug that into the filter that reduces some of the highs and makes the sound a bit smooth, and then you chuck it out into the audio uh, output. So this uh, 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 the ability to generate audio using such signal flow graphs is a kind of a milestone leap in the, in, in the audio capabilities of the browser. So this doesn't uh, come out of the blue. It's got a long precedent in computer music history. Uh, so I'll share some examples of uh, where this stuff comes from so that you get an idea of how th this material uh, is organized. I mean, how this API itself is structured and organized. So uh, C sound was one of the very early and very influential systems in computer music. Uh, was developed sometime around 1986, and uh, it itself based on an older program called Music M. Uh, it uh, introduced very uh, some concepts that are persistent to date. So, for example, the instrument and score split. So you see the uh, you see there's a section that defines what your instruments are, and there's a section that's orchestrating these instruments. So the instrument specification uh, talks about uh, okay, I'm just doing a simple oscillator from a sine wave table, and I'm taking that signal, which is A1, and I'm outputting it to the audio uh, file. So in this case, it's an offline processing. So, uh, and it also introduced the concepts of uh, control rate versus audio rate distinction. So, uh, audio sampling rates are generally very high, like 48,000 hertz per 48,000 samples per second. But you don't necessarily want to control these sounds at that same rate. 
either for computational reasons or you just don't need that kind of fidelity. So the, there's a distinction between control rate or K rate and uh, the audio rate. This has been borrowed into uh, subsequent systems as well. So this is a pretty influential uh, uh, system. And uh, this is Max. Uh, this is also since 86. It was developed by Miller Pocket and uh, further developed by David Ziccarelli. Uh, it, uh, it's now a commercial product and it's one of the staple uh, programs that it, that's used by a large section of the computer music community. Every audio device that you can buy probably has some kind of a plugin that will patch into Max. So it's a data flow kind of paradigm where you do all your programming visually and the whole system is live. And it uh, supports both control signals as well as audio signals. And uh, these days, Max has even more capabilities. It can also do visual processing and graphics and uh, uh, more rich media stuff like that. So this is pure data. So Miller Pocket made a, an open source version of the same Max-like system. And this is one of the very dense screenshots of uh, uh, what's, what's called NetPD uh, in action. This kind of cockpit-like interfaces are fairly common in the computer music community, so it's, it's pretty interesting to always look at them, the degree of control that musicians demand. So this is since 1990, so it's pretty old already. What, the reason I put this screenshot up is that this, these systems were not only being used for making noises, they were also being used for making interfaces to control those noises. So this is Super Collider. Uh, it's a client-server kind of system where the server does the signal uh, signal flow graph rendering, and there's a client-side uh, language, pretty general-purpose multi-paradigm language that's used to control what's happening on this uh, synth server. And uh, even su Super Collider also has uh, uh, routines for um, putting up interfaces and uh, synchronizing the commands that you send via these interfaces to the server. So that's 96. So this is, before the Web Audio API, I did some of my, uh, my own synthesis work in Super Collider, and this is uh, an example. You don't need to read the code here, but just the gist of it is that there are two sections. One is uh, trying to synthesize the Vena tone out of it, and the second one is trying to control that tone uh, to make Kamakas and Carnatic music, so that was part of my work um, before the Web Audio API. But now I don't need to do this because I can do all of this stuff in the browser itself. Uh, this uh, Chuck, since 2003, Chuck brought what's uh, known as synchronous uh, programming into the, uh, an explicit model of time into the, into the programming language itself. And even the language looks sort of like a wiring diagram. So you've got a sine wave oscillator M that's uh, modulating a sine oscillator C and that's being uh, pumped into the DAC. DAC is digital to analog converter, so that's the audio output. And uh, so the the equals, the right arrow thing is generally referred to as Chuck. So Sinos M Chuck to Sinos C Chuck to DAC. So that's how you read the code in this case. So there's an explicit model of time. So time is being progressed in uh, sections of one second in this case. So the notion of a signal flow graph is very common across all of these systems uh, right from 1986 to today. And the Web Audio API builds on top of this. But what it does, while the other systems also had to build these user interfaces and others, uh, other, other uh, supporting systems um, into them for, it, for them to be useful, like Pure Data and Super Collider, the Web Audio API, of course, does much less. It just handles the audio part, but leverages everything else that's, that you have, we have in the browser today. And that's very powerful. So uh, the, it changes a lot of things for us, because we now have a kind of a cross-platform audio programming environment. I'm going to uh, share uh, uh, a demo of a system that's called the Rhythm Engine. It was developed originally in the late 90s, around 96, 97, um, by my supervisor, Peter Kellogg. And uh, it was developed for Windows, and it ran on the old Windows machines and output MIDI, uh, and it controlled drum uh, sounds on the MIDI. And uh, this, uh, uh, once, I, mean, I, I rewrote the whole system using the Web Audio API so that it's now accessible via browsers via just a single click. And that's the kind of uh, preservation of ideas, and there's some important ideas behind the Rhythm Engine that I'll just talk about shortly. Uh, I'm going to switch to my demo there. So. The 
it clear enough? Yeah. So the, um, the, the regime engine score idea is what if we, uh, a rhythm can be represented as a point in a multidimensional space where each of the axes is some kind of perceptually continuous thing. By that what I mean is there is some kind of more of straightness or more of offbeat in one direction or more of uh, phase shift or more or less of uh, various parameters. Right? So, uh, if we represent a particular rhythm in this kind of multidimensional space, then we can do very interesting things with them. So, uh, in this case, uh, I just start by playing one, one, just one drum. So, just choose my kit. Play. So, this is a very simple beat, right? So, this is what's called a straight beat. So, this is, you will find that in, in rock quite often. Right? So, I'm going to switch that, I'm going to reduce its straightness for a little bit, it's going to go, it's just going to become slower, but then, so that's a diff completely different kind of feel, right? So, uh, and uh, what you can, what you can do uh, with this, you can also play around with the threshold to reduce its complexity, complexity right? You see how it slowly shifts from one kind of uh, intensity to the other. So. Uses accents to achieve that. Okay. So um, this uh, um, now that's just one voice. Now we can add more voices. But instead of going through all of that manually, what I'm just going to do is I'm going to drag and drop a preset file, uh, and uh, so that I can show you what we can do with that. So this is there are four voices in this case, and uh, um, I'll, I'll talk you through this. So this is a very simple beat. So what I've done is I've created four presets out of these four voices that have totally different characteristics, and or no, not totally different characters, somewhat different characteristics. And uh, uh, I place those presets into this space. Now I can smoothly morph between them. So, like, kind of a, a smooth space. I mean, there are a few uh, of the rhythms that are common between these four. Uh, but uh, that's, uh, uh, by, by representing all of these four rhythms in, in this kind of continuous space, I can now, like, move, move between them smoothly. So this, uh, it, it was possible to bring this kind of a live interaction onto the web, um, primarily only after the Web Audio API came into existence. So. We'll revisit the beep a little bit uh, at this point. So there are lots of issues with this, if you, you might notice. Like, uh, how am I doing on time? Yeah, that's okay. So this, uh, uh, you'll see that uh, it, it creates an oscillator, but then it doesn't return anything. So how is it that, uh, 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 how do we know that the sound is going to persist till the sound finishes? For example, why, I mean, uh, what if the garbage collector kicks in and destroys all of them because all these references are going away? This is something that the uh, uh, WebAudio API takes care of for you. It maintains the references to these nodes in the, in the, in the background until they are no longer needed. Uh, so, uh, one of the issues with this is that the oscillator node in particular and the source nodes um, in, the, in the API are what are called ephemeral nodes. So, they are one shot. You trigger them once and uh, after you stop them, you cannot use them again. They have to be reclaimed and you have to create new. Item. This this stumps a lot of people who are initially coming to the web audio API. So the what happens is uh, this. So when we did the beep uh, 332.0, uh, this is what's set up for us. And uh, after two seconds, nothing. So this whole thing just disappears uh, after two seconds if you if we no longer hold any references to the oscillator. But even holding references to the oscillator is of no help because you cannot start it again. If you start it again, it will throw an exception by specification. So, 
how do we make the max kind of uh, interface for web or your API if the nodes keep disappearing disappearing willy-nilly, right? So that's a that's an issue. So this uh, um, uh, what we can do as with most of problems in computer science, we can add a level of indirection. We can create a gain node to which all these uh, processing elements are connecting instead, and pipe that to the output. Now, when we do that. Uh, what happens after two seconds would be something like this. You'd get something, you'd at least have that gain node intact. But after two seconds, you're free to beep again. And you can actually beep as many times as you want, even before the two seconds finishes, because they'll all get mixed into the same uh, uh, gain node anyway. So this is one approach that we can use to create a stable illusion, of, an illusion of stable models. So uh, in essence, what we are doing is that we are letting the web audio API be the uh, server component of what I showed in Super Collider, and uh, we are making use of JavaScript to just orchestrate it, uh, just uh, trigger sounds, uh, letting them die on their own, so uh, and uh, uh, basically making noise. So the the 2.0 is an important thing here. So the sound dies precisely two seconds afterwards. By precisely, what I mean is. Uh, the precision is like one sample, so it's sample accurate timing is provided by the web audio API. It's precision of like typically one out of one by forty eight thousand of a second if that's your sampling rate. The second uh, problem is that we want interactivity, so the, this is the problem with the beep function. We schedule the beep to disappear two seconds afterwards, but what if we change our minds before the two seconds is finished? What we really want is we want just in time scheduling for these kinds of sounds. So the uh, when we do when we so is set timeout adequate for this? So let's let's just create a timer that's going to uh, kill the um, kill the beep after two seconds. But then if we change our mind, we can always kill that timer. But that's not good enough because set timeout has very poor jitter um, characteristics in the in the browser. Like no musician would respect the kind of jitter jitter that set timeout shows. Uh, the so set time mode, set time mode is not an option. Neither is set interval. Set interval is a little bit better, but it's still not an option. Request animation frame is a very good candidate. The jitter characteristics for this are very good uh, relative to the others, and it's tied to the display refresh rate. So it runs typically at 60 times a second on its own. So that's uh, uh, so request animation frame in conjunction with the sample accurate timing of the web audio API, we can get great uh, interactivity and timing timing accuracy. So what happens is that uh, we want to compute uh, audio for about a little bit more than the next uh, uh, request animation frame call back, so that by the time it arrives, there is at least something that's going to go out and we're not going to stall or the audio is not going to break up. So this is the typical pattern of overlapping uh, uh, computation of audio that we want to do in real time. So when I moved that morph slider in the rhythm engine demo, what you saw there was, uh, uh, was that these computations were sort of making instant by instant choices on what to do next. So, and uh, especially when it comes to the tempo changes. So, and uh, the Web Audio API provides something called a script processor. You can write arbitrary JavaScript code that emits sound. You can actually compute float 32 buffers and send it out to the audio and it will play back. But there are some, in the current uh, specification and implementations, there are some serious drawbacks to the script processor. Uh, that permit no, that do not permit it to be used uh, um, very well with the other nodes. I'll show a couple of cases of that. So uh, a library that I wrote just that, that gathers all of these lessons into a uh, handful of functions, uh, which is Stellar. Uh, the, so the first problem of the disappearing nodes is solved by Stellar's graph node, uh, which uh, which makes uh, makes it easy to create stable uh, abstract sound models. And then the scheduler uh, is uh, uh, is an interesting part of uh, Stellar. So what it does is uh, the scheduler separates the specification of an interaction, interactive uh, audio visual rendering, from the uh, from its actual playtime. And then apart uh, and apart from that, it also takes care of sample accurate timing and just in time timing, just in time uh, decisions as well. So I'll show a couple of examples uh, just after I walk through graph node and the uh, scheduler a bit. So graph node is a very simple function of this kind. It takes any object and then turns it into something that can participate in the signal flow graph. 
So, and uh, the scheduler is uh, um, uh, that the player of the scheduler works on functions of this kind. So, if you are familiar with functional programming, this it, you can read this pretty much as a continuation passing style uh, thing or callback passing style uh, function, except that now a clock is being threaded through these callbacks. So, that this, uh, this asynchronous uh, thing is happening over time and the timing uh, is precise in this case. So, and it also provides a, a whole number of higher order functions that you can draw on for, uh, uh, for composing different sounds together. So, uh, I built a small uh, uh, explorer for uh, playing around with uh, both the scheduler and the graph nodes. I'll uh, show a little bit of that. So, so this is the Stellar Explorer. Um, uh, ignore the comments, they are not so important. Uh, that's just for the person who's visiting that for the first time. Um, what they can uh, do here is I want to show, uh, I want to beep for the first time like a child, right? So that's, that's been uh, one of the things. So I'm going to do some bit of live coding here just for kicks. If I, I'm just creating a, uh, I'm, I'm creating a built-in chime model. I'm instantiating it in the ch variable. Uh, and uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to make a note uh, of this. 72 comma 0.5, that's one note, and uh, n equals ch note of 79 comma 0.5, that's another note. But these notes are just models for playing back those notes. They're not actually being played just yet. And you can play them as many times as you want. So if I do play, so that's the first note, and that's the second note. But then what, what I can do is I can put them together into a track and do this, uh, do that. So, so, okay. So that's, uh, um, well, this thing just plays and stops. So I want to keep it going for a while, uh, while I make a few other tweaks. So I can just loop that. So this is going to keep playing while I'm going to do a few other things. So when I click on the CH, I can get the I get the half life and a few other controls. So, so the sounds get elongated in real time all of them. So this is a very simple beginning, uh, and I'll show a couple of uh, more interesting examples of that. So this is uh, this combines precise synchro synchronized visuals with the sound. It's again the simple uh, random notes being played, um, but there are also synchronized visuals here. So I'm just going to select everything and just hit run. You know. That's interesting. It looks like there's a bit of a delay through the visual system, so you can notice uh, breaks in synchronization. For that. And uh, now I can control this uh, uh, in real time, right? So, as usual. And now, what I can do is I can also change the speed. provides you uh, in terms of live control. So. Okay. Let's stop. 
So uh, that uh, brings me to roughly the close of this. Uh, so there are a few goodies coming. I, mean, I mentioned a couple of problems that people usually run into and these are being addressed. One of them is that we do not have a clear way to coordinate the musical events that are generated by the, that you schedule in the Web Audio API to other events that you might want to do like visuals or sending out MIDI or controlling lighting using MIDI or any of the other uh, display activities that might do um, in it. So there is additional facility coming in for uh, doing this. So currently we have current time that always progresses in real time, but uh, there's work uh, on to specifying and implementing a current play time so that we have a clear idea of when the sound that I'm computing is actually going to be heard by people. So that's the output latency. Uh, this information is going to be available and it will completely change the precision with which we can orchestrate things in the, in the browser. So the second thing is, uh, that's really exciting is audio workers. So the, I mentioned that uh, the script processor node provides, lets you write job, arbitrary JavaScript and compute uh, float 32 buffers that you can ship out to the audio system. So that, uh, um, in the current implementation, those scripts run in the main thread. So if you have other activity that's going on in the main thread, it's going to seriously impact the audio that uh, you're generating. You are, you are likely to end up glitching the audio. As a consequence, what people do is they have very large buffers, like 2048 samples or maybe even 4096 samples, and uh, those uh, and that ends up in reducing the latency. And the whole point, uh, uh, the Web Audio API was, uh, was began. People began working on it in the first place was to have low latency audio. With the audio workers uh, initiative, we're going to have the JS code run right in the audio thread and without any breaks, uh, uh, without interfering with the main thread, which means you can do your UI in the main thread and have the audio be smooth. Uh, that's a super big deal because we now have uh, arbitrary JS code that's on par with the native code that uh, uh, the browsers put in uh, for the, all the processing, the, the filters and all the other native code filters. Uh, it's even, it would even be possible to completely re-implement all the native functionality in pure JavaScript at that particular, uh, when that happens. And I'm actually looking forward to that because that leads to uh, some really cool things that you can, can do which you cannot do at the moment. So one thing that uh, uh, I want to show in that is, show about that is the bug that we have. I and mean, we call it a bug, but this is what's... Uh, uh, in the current implementation, as I mentioned, the script processor node runs in the main thread. And uh, because it's running in the main thread, it's, uh, uh, there's got to be events being passed back and forth between the audio thread and the main thread. This means every time you pipe audio through uh, a script processor node, it incurs some major delay. And uh, this is code where you're not supposed to hear any delay between these from a conceptual perspective, but because of the implementation and the specification at this point in today's stage, you will hear that. Because uh, uh, all I'm doing in this case is I'm writing an on-audio process that's uh, copying data from any, its input pin to the output pin and doing absolutely nothing else. So if that's if all that's all what it's doing, then if I pipe the input data directly to the speaker and the JavaScript output to the speaker, I shouldn't be able to hear a difference. But now in this case, I can hear a delay, and that's what I mean. We will uh, will get better. So you can hear two tones. So, uh, in principle, you're, you're supposed to hear only one tone uh, if there's no, if the script node does not add any delay. If you add uh, uh, other native nodes, like a gain node or something, instead of the script node that also does the same kind of copying, you would not hear that delay. And we want the JavaScript code to also coexist, I mean, have basically the same performance characteristics as native code uh, to get some very interesting functionality out. So, that's, uh, that's what's coming up and once this is up, like, uh, I'm super excited about that. Uh, so uh, in conjunction, I, as I mentioned initially, the Web Audio API just deals with the audio part of it and uh, uh, leaving, uh, just leveraging everything else that's getting into the browser and being put into the browser by other teams. So the creative possibilities are just exploding at this particular point and especially when you throw in networking, people are doing network jam sessions using this. Google has done a few demos on that front. 
Uh, as it stands, quite a few of the old Web Audio API demos are broken because the spec is also evolving and the browser implementations have also evolved, but the code has not kept pace. So you may find, if you go around exploring, you may find that the uh, demos are a bit broken. But never mind, they'll, they'll catch up once the uh, version 1 is uh, uh, finalized and people are happy with audio workers. So, uh, thank you. I'm at the end. And any questions? Hey, uh, great talk, by the way. Uh, one question. If you heard about Chris Wilson, yeah. he's already working on Web Audio and all those things. Right. His project regarding Web Audio Playground, do you think in future that your libraries can be fused together to create something fun? Uh, because perhaps. right now he has run uh, like uh, core JavaScript coding, mm -hmm. if you see the code. But uh, the, on top of it, if we introduce your libraries over there, like graph node and all those things, do you see any benefit over there? Uh, uh, I wrote those mostly for my own purpose because I found reusing the graph node and the scheduler to be much easier to uh, to do. I don't, I don't have to keep solving the same problem every time I make a project of that kind. Right? So. Um, so, um, of course, reuse is always welcome on that front. I mean, I've had a couple of requests. People have tried to use Stellar for uh, um, uh, um, for actually writing a DAW as, a, as, an, as an audio editor and also uh, orchestrating full sequences of uh, signal processing flows. Um, and uh, so, there is some interest in that in, in that regard, but. Uh, Quite often what I find is that the code just gets, the code for doing the timing especially, that keeps getting reinvented. Um, maybe uh, uh, maybe once the current playtime and other things stabilize, then it would become less important. It may become less important. Uh, we'll see when that happens. Sure. Thank you. Uh, from take the notes and uh, try playing it. Uh, it's not so much libraries, it's more like, uh, that's more music domain stuff. Uh, uh, in fact, part of my research work, I, I showed you some super collider code that did Vena synthesis, but I mean, that was part of my research as well. The, uh, we do not have an adequate formal understanding of uh, our Raga system, even though we have a lot of musicological literature on it. So, uh, and synthesis is a great way to explore the rules behind this system. So, just go ahead and keep doing it. Like, uh, uh, play around with uh, node generation, play around with Gamaka generation, just keep doing it until you figure out what, what that's right. We don't have major libraries today to, uh, to do that. No, uh, there are, there is some amount of work, uh, some, uh, um, for example, there's a system called Gaiaka that you can take a look at. Uh, uh, it's not based on web audio, but it uh, provides some amount of intelligent uh, uh, Gamaka filling of uh, phrases and ragas. My own work was based on, uh, my PhD thesis was based on Gaika's, was building on top of Gaika's work. And uh, the, uh, uh, there is still a lot more to be done. We're probably like uh, five years before uh, we have major, uh, uh, very interesting results to show on that front. There, there's already some amount of interesting results, but we need more understanding to come on that. Hello. Yeah, hi. Um, great talk, by the way. Uh, I had uh, two questions. First was regarding uh, debugging. Um, obviously, you're, when you're making all that kind of stuff, you need to test, you need to debug. Uh, what's your experience with that? And uh, with the developer tools, if you use them, is there any kind of feedback that you would want browser makers to, to do? And the second part is uh, regarding, you know, this was about the Web Audio API, but I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on uh, the Get User Media API. And the Get User Media API, in yeah. which people okay. can actually, you know, in, take input from the the mic, right? And uh, have you played around with that uh, and combine it with the Web Audio API? Yeah, uh, uh, I'll take the first one. Debugging uh, in the case of music is pretty, uh, in, to some extent, easy because you hear the wrong result. 
you hear what you don't expect. So it's a bit easier on that front. Apart from that, the regular development tools uh, surface. Um, the, regarding the uh, web RTC, uh, the, um, uh, the get user media I mean, the microphone input is already integrated into the web audio API. In fact, Stellar already has a module called mic that just lets you uh, grab the microphone input and pipe it through processing routines. Uh, the, um, uh, the other integration with some of the other media stream APIs, uh, uh, like when you, you like loading a, uh, loading an audio or video thing off a URL and then piping that through the web audio APIs processing system, that's being worked on. Uh, good parts of that are implemented in Firefox, but not in Chrome yet. So it's in various stages of implementation and proposal at this stage. Thank you, Shri Kumar. So, uh, feedback forms have been distributed to you guys.